Howdy folks and welcome back to Interview with a Neuroscientist. Now this series has moved off of YouTube, so I just wanted to let you guys know who are watching this on YouTube that this is now part of our podcast. We have a new podcast called Numenta on Intelligence, and uh, so if you want to subscribe to it, search for Numenta on Intelligence. I have interviewed two neuroscientists so far on that podcast, Alex Vaughn and Blake Richards. So if you want to hear those, you'll have to go uh, subscribe to that podcast, and I will continue to put interviews there. However, for this one, I decided uh, to try and record while I was Skyping with Dr. Conrad Cording. The recording turned out pretty well, so I thought, why not put it out on YouTube at the same time as we release the podcast? So I'm going to put it out in both places. So I hope you enjoy this interview with uh, the neuroscientist Conrad Cording. Okay, yeah, I, th I think it's because I turned the recording on. <laughs> okay. Hello, recording. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it says that you're recording the call. Uh, great. Cool. Uh, well, good, nice good. talking with you. So, so what exactly is the objective? Like, I, I always oh, try so, to yeah, see yeah, like what's what's driving the whole thing. So, my drive is is a couple things. Uh, first, so I'm a community manager for for Numenta, and I'm trying to uh, foster this community of like hobbyists. Sci scientists, engineers, it's a very diverse community of people, you know, when you just open something up like this, you get a lot of interesting perspectives. But the, my main focus is education. Um, and I really am trying to focus young people, like with this series of interviews in general, I'd like to, to, uh, to try and engage people to be interested in how intelligence works and how the brain is implementing it and things like that, because that's what got me into it, right? So I'm sort of focusing on the new generation um, of AI experts as they're growing. And I really want them to learn how intelligence works, not just the Bayesian models necessarily, you know. Oh, so that's us. Yes. And I'm really I'm focusing on how my company is trying to understand the brain and the discoveries uh, uh, that we think we're making and the theory that we the way we think it works, you know, because it's theory. It's it's theory and we want to we we're we we're not doing experiments, but we're always looking at the experimental data to make sure that the theory still works, you know, in the context of these new new right. experiments and stuff coming up. And the reason I came to you is because you're you're sort of the type of neuroscientist now that the way you think about the brain really aligns well with the way we think about the brain. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to hear. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, as you know, I come from a Bayesian background. Right I now, I might be a little more connectionist than Bayesian. It uh, ebbs and flows. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you can't get the Bayesian out of uh, a thinker. No? Like for me, I see everything through a Bayesian lens, even if I'm not doing Bayesian things anymore. That's a totally different, and that's great, because that's a perspective that I can't present to my audience, because I didn't come from that perspective. Uh, by trade, I'm a software engineer. I didn't learn any of the maths involved. I just learned how to build things with software, <laughs> right? And so uh, I came out of this from an engineering standpoint. How do I build intelligence? That was my interest. Like, what if something is intelligent, and we can figure out how to reverse engineer it and build it? So that's really the direction we're coming from. And I know, and we're meeting in the middle. I mean, eventually we're all going to meet in the middle and build something amazing. Like that's the vision, right? <laughs> You're right, right, right. You know, you should have started the interview. It starts to be fun. Like people might find these topics oh, interesting throw, already. <laughs> we may as well throw this in. I mean, uh, it's yeah. recording. <laughs> awesome, okay. cool. Um, so great to meet you, by the way. Uh, and and I haven't like introduced you to the audience or anything, but um, since we're already recording, the interview's probably started. Everyone, this is uh, Dr. Conrad Cording. Uh, I don't have a good intro. Let me let you introduce yourself. I think that I find that's better for people anyway, because I always mess it up. <laughs> well, I am not sure if I'm good at introducing myself. So I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, I'm a failed experimentalist. I started my PhD recording from primary visual cortex of the cat. Didn't work all that well. So I ended up... Uh, thinking more about how we could use math and computation to understand the brain. And uh, I looked at the brain from many different perspectives over time. I was a Bayesian for a long time. I think about uh, neural computing my entire life in a way. I'm interested in deep learning and how the brain might be like deep learning and how it might be different. And uh, beyond neuroscience, I'm interested in what we can meaningfully say about the world using data. And, uh, 
I, I'm I'm bad at introducing myself in that way. It's a, it's I'm just interested in whatever is interesting. That's a good way to put it. I mean, that's this. I'm the same way. I just haven't taken like the PhD track, and a, and a lot of people in our community are the same. We're very passionate about trying to understand how things work, but uh, um, but you know, there's 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 no major. I get asked this a lot uh, in our community. What should I study? You know, if I want to understand like how intelligence works and and this next sort of era of AI, what should I study? Computational neuroscience or straight up neuroscience or go straight with math and physics and it's hard to say, really. <laughs> but I think the answer is yes. Yeah, exactly. You, sh you, sh you should probably study all of them. No, like yeah. at some level, if you don't understand psychology, it's hard for you to get what intelligence is about. If you don't study math, it's very hard to make what you want to say concrete. If you don't study computation, you can't actually implement it. In lots of problems, you only see it once you try to build it. Yeah. And and similarly, methods from physics, they just help you think about the brain in a broader way, I think. It took me a very long time to, to finally come to like a, a somewhat of a basic understanding of intelligence. <laughs> and even please, that is very broad and abstract, you know. Please, please share it. I'm sometimes very unclear about how the brain works. <laughs> oh, gosh, don't put me on the spot. You're the <laughs> interviewing you. So let me let me flip it on you because you said you used to be a Bayesian. It's sort of like maybe you've changed your view a bit. One of the things or the the things I found it was a theme in your writing or in in the papers that you produced is that if you structure your experiment in the right way, there's I mean it's amazing how much data we can get now from experiments and it's just getting more and more. And in, and because it's so messy sometimes, you can structure your experiment that you will find what you're looking for sometimes, even though it may not be what you're looking for, right? Maybe you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, like, oftentimes in behavioral experiments, what you look is you're looking for some kind of an effect. Say, is uncertainty relevant when you make decisions? So I give you a task where uncertainty is really useful. Like, you knowing how uncertain you are is really essential. So. There's one thing you should do if you're very uncertain, another thing that you should do if you're very certain about the situation. Right. And everything else will be the same. So if you want only uncertainty matters, and then yes, you use uncertainty, and we've shown that in, a, in many experiments. But if I give you a situation where the reward matters and nothing else, you'll look for the reward. If I give you a situation where at some level, arousal matters or something, like how much you're like engaged in a task, well, then that will matter. If I yeah. give you a task where, say, color matters, well, then color matters. So yeah. at some level, uncertainty, there was like uh, in the early 2000s, like mid-2000, uh, like, like 2005, maybe up to 2010, there were all of a sudden lots of labs that said, well, let's see if uncertainty is important. And they all found that uncertainty is important. Yeah. But if we had instead gotten all excited about color, then we might have had brain theories that are centered around the idea of color. So in the end, like when these fields like really start going, the question is really what what we then know in in the end. You know, like we now know that uncertainty matters. Sure. If I ask you. How certain are you that like you will get up between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. tomorrow? You'll get me a pretty precise answer to that. If I ask you how certain it is that I'll get up in that interval, which you'll have more uncertainty about, sure, you will be less precise. And right. once I give you some information, you'll be better at that. Right. So, so my view was very much based on like uncertainty as like that centerpiece of the way intelligence works. And you can tell a story where everything you do is about uncertainty. Right. Now you can tell another story, which is everything is about learning. There's a story that you can tell just as well, where you could say, well, um, if you make a mistake, if something goes wrong, you'll change and next time you'll be better. Now that view can equally in a way and explain a lot of Intelligence, not in 
uncertainty gives us. So uncertainty says, along with something that I know, I kind of star how sudden I am with about it, uh, about it. Right. which means that if I'm very uncertain about something, I will rely less on the thing than if I'm very certain about something. Now, a learning system will do the same thing because it figures out that in the cases where it was very certain but ignored the things, it did worse than the cases where it was very certain and used the things. And in the uncertain thing cases, where it was very uncertain about things and very much relied on it, that it was a mistake. Mm. And so therefore, where we are on that continuum, I'm not sure. No, like you could be that the brain, we're born as people who are there to deal with uncertainty because uncertainty is so important. Mm. In which case, if you want, like, uncertainty is built into, like, the plan with which our brain is made. Or alternatively, we could be really good at learning. And we would never know the difference. Would you say that uncertainty is sort of one dimension of an aspect of our brain? It applies to all, lots of other things that are, that are happening there? Or? Yeah, I think it is an aspect of reasoning. It's an right. important aspect of reasoning. You know? Like things that you're more uncertain about it are less important in a way. And if you have a bunch of things that you're somewhat uncertain about each of them, you can typically combine them to become more certain. You know? right. right. Who are your friends? That's problem solving. You know? It's problem solving, exactly. And dealing with uncertainty is an unavoidable aspect of intelligence, of problem solving. Right. So let me say, let me, I visualize this a lot in my head. It's hard, right? Um, when I think about ideas and objects or things, you know, discrete things that we think about, you can apply an uncertainty to it. I like to think about those things as like multidimensional attractors. Like there's some match in your brain, there's some certain neurons that fire when you think about a specific thing. And the uncertainty about that is sort of like how messy and noisy is that attract? How well defined is that thing in your neurons and the connections between them? But but that is one way how the brain could deal with uncertainty. It's not the only way how you could deal with uncertainty. Let's say um, it's possible that kind of let's say we have some estimation. Is that thing behind you a guitar that I see? Now, let's say if my video was somewhat blurred. It could be that it's a guitar. It could also just be that it's like a painting or something behind you. Yeah. No. So there's two very different ways how the brain could represent such a thing. It could either be if I'm uncertain, if, if they say the image quality is low, I kind of like my brain activity is very messy. But alternatively, my brain activity could be absolutely not messy at all, where I could say, this could be a guitar, exactly this guitar, with probability 0.9, or this It's not messy at all. I could say guitar, not guitar. And so at some level, this messiness of neural code is, is something that communicates to other parts of the brain that we're uncertainty about uncertain about it is only one of many codes. You could, for yeah. example, say that there is just a cell that says, uh, how uncertain is my visual system at the moment? In right. which case, everything is uncertain. has no effect whatsoever. No messiness involved ever. Mm. But we have like one cell that basically says, very uncertain, not very uncertain. Interesting. So, the, so if you get an ambiguous sensory input and you're trying to do object identification, you could, once you uh, match it with the best thing, you could just snap, that's it. You've made the decision, right? You've sort of applied your vision of a guitar. If you've decided that's a guitar, you make the decision, I'm gonna apply my idea of what a guitar is to that object in space, right? And it's no longer really, you're, you're certain about it. I mean, your certainty at least has gone way up because you've made that decision. You're right. And, uh, and, and let me let me show you two areas in which case these two ways of thinking about uncertainty feel very different. Sure. So let's say one case where you see a guitar and it's very dark. So there's a small number of photons. So you can't be sure if it's the guitar. And in that case, you can say maybe the neural activity is very messy because kind of stuff comes in and we're 
unsure how to interpret it in this let's say, small like number of photons. Yeah. In that case like this, disorderly seems like a very natural way of thinking about uncertainty. Mm. Okay, let me take you to another case where that seems like really weird. So if I, I study movement a lot. Yeah. So in movement, when when I don't show you your hand, you don't see your hand for a while, it turns out that you become uncertain of where your hand is because right. your proprioception has this thing that's called drift. So basically, if I like rotate your hand here and hold it long enough, you will kind of no longer know exactly where it is. I know exactly what this feels like because I meditate and sometimes I'll wake up feeling like my arms are in a different place, knowing that they aren't really there, but <laughs> that having so that cool. sensation like they're somewhere different. There's also the, do you know the rubber hand illusion? Uh, no, what's that? Okay, rubber hand illusion is amazing. So they take a rubber arm that's not yours. They put it right next to your arm. Then they hide your actual arm. Okay, so there's like now a divider. Think about it like there's a divider. You yeah. see the rubber hand. You don't see your real hand. And then what they do is they stimulate the rubber hand and your real hand with like just some mechanical device at the same time. Right. And after they've done it often enough, it feels as if this rubber hand is like totally your hand. Yeah, that makes sense to me uh, because you're now, you're sort of like projecting your experience that you've observed several times, predicting that you're going to feel this. And since you see it happening, even though you don't feel it happening, you're like, well, that's good enough. That's good well, enough. But, like <laughs> but, but you feel it happen. That's how they trick your brain into it, by stimulating it at the same time. Right. Whenever you see that the rubber hand gets touched, your real hand gets touched. Uh, and by doing that often enough, they convince your brain that the rubber hand's totally your arm. And then if someone gets out a knife and steps into the rubber hand, you will be scared to death. Right. <laughs> okay, yeah. so that's the rubber hand illusion. But what it, what it shows is that, that you have considerable uncertainty about where your hand is. Now, when you don't see it, now, here's the interesting thing. If you want to know how much uncertainty you have about where your hand is, it's not something fuzzy about the visual input or something. It is about you memorizing how long it's been since you last saw your hand. Oh, right, right. Okay, so in that case, how uncertain you are something is not something that happens from the visual stimulus. It's exactly the same visual stimulus. It is something that comes from... So it's a like something that you, over time, right? It, that's right. It's something it that depends. you need to to learn about. Something you need to integrate. So there are in one case, based on what you're doing at any moment in the context of your actions. That's right. So in one case, uncertainty is something that's like in the image. In the other case, it's something that you learned over time that is not in the image at all, but that's something that's instantaneous. Right. So in that second view, the idea that uncertainty is sort of something that's in the in the uns, in the in the fuzziness of the neural representation kind of doesn't make much sense because like the vicious stimulus is exactly the same. Where right. is that uncertainty at that part coming from? Some other disconnection up here. <laughs> yeah, no, this is this is weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, you can convince your. It, this is sort of the problem with belief. You know, uh, you can convince yourself over time if you're given enough evidence that something completely wrong is true. You know, uh, and you believe that uh, until you get enough counter evidence that you can change your your beliefs. And if someone convinces you <laughs> experimentally that that's that's your hand, that's your hand, that's your hand, I can see that. I mean, they're tricking you. You're ch they're changing your belief structure in your brain for that small period of time, at least. Is this this right? And you can of course make a Bayesian argument for that. You know, like if the rubber hand actually is your hand, it is very unsurprising that whenever the rubber hand gets stimulated, you feel it. All right. If the rubber hand in your hand would be different how how improbable is it that they always get stimulated at the same time so in a way from a statistical perspective your brain does the right thing it right it, it's yeah. very likely that it, the rubber arm actually is yours right if you don't know that the experimentalist actually designs the stimulation to make trick you into believing it's the same right
Yeah, that's that is interesting. <laughs> um, so uh, we were we started off talking with uh, about um, you, you just sometimes you're not able to find what you're looking for. Sometimes it, just looking for something you find a correlation that might not be the correct correlation because you're not looking at it from a more general aspect. Um, so you've I think you've written a bit about how to do these type of generalization studies. Is that a way to counter this in experiments anyway? Yeah, so in experiments, I think in neuroscience, we really need to stop doing generalization studies much more. So what we typically do is we do one experiment and then we have one theory that goes with that experiment. Right. A generalization study, I do one experiment, figure out what the theory is for that, and then I do a very different experiment and I see if my theory still works. This is something that we almost never do in neuroscience and rarely in psychology. These resulting theories from it, they are not put to the test. Now, if you, for example, say, here's a brain area, we record it from it. We find that neurons have tuning to orientation. Therefore, this must be an area that does orientation discrimination. The well, Google and Wiesel stuff. Yeah. Google and Wiesel stuff. And a lot of, and it's the same logic of, of, what, of a lot of what came afterwards. Yeah. That statement without a generalization study means almost nothing for all that we care about. Every feature of the world that we should, could change could change the activity of those neurons. There was a recent Carandini study that basically showed that locomotor activities is all over the visual cortex. So, yeah, yeah. so but this but, is just to, to kind of, without a generalization study, it's very hard to know what we have learned in theory space. So how should neuroscientists go about that? Uh, well, one of the things you do is, is you collect data from a lot of different places, right? You create your own studies because everyone's got so much data. So you think that this is, this is an area that's ripe for other labs to try and do sort of these cross generalization studies using existing data? Yeah, I think time is, times are pretty good for us data parasites, no? <laughs> um, yeah, a lot better no, than five years ago, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, I mean, like I very much believe in in there being like an ecosystem for ideas yeah no yeah. like what is the probability that an experimental lab can look at their data and figure out kind of statements that make sense about intelligence not like that glue between like data and ideas that is something that we have in the past often delegated to purely experimental labs and intelligence is pretty complicated, at least as far as I'm concerned for the moment. Um, I, I think we need like an ecosystem where people really can come up with ideas, find ways of formalizing it, find ways of testing it. And that used to be very difficult. And it, it's not just on the experimental side, the same thing on theorists side, that lots of theorists are loath to actually get their hands dirty and like show that their ideas are born out in data. I. Right. I, I think we need those bridges. Well, I'm uh, totally on board with that cause. Uh, I, th I think that there's so many good ideas out there and so many people approaching this problem from different places. J making those bridges is super important so that we can all you know, build something and progress this area together in the future. I almost forgot to mention this is part one of a two-part series, but I'm sure there's a link somewhere you can get to the next one.